if I'm targeting anybody, I've been on the Nick Chubb bandwagon for a long time. I'm not hopping off of it now. Uh, I love the addition of Jack Conklin through free agency. And I'm not scared of Hunt if you can cuff him. I think that gives you a locked and loaded top five running back. So I'm with you. I'm on board uh, the, the Chubb train in 2020 top five running back. You're watching the Fantasy Football Show. Smitty. Take a lap. I'm here with Jake from the Fantasy Headliners. Really pumped to have you on, man. You have a great channel. You guys have grown uh, tremendously in the last year uh, you were at like 30 something thousand right about a year ago and you're you're sitting at like 80 yeah i mean it's been an absolutely crazy year um, i mean it was a, it was a big year as far as growth goes but you know we launched a website the fancyheadliners.com is out there we had our first ever draft guide I and mean, we put a lot of pieces into play last year that we hadn't done in the past and yeah going from 30 to 80 in a season was great and i'm just hoping you know for for something great here in 2020 yeah well i i think you're i think that's an understatement man you're gonna <laughs> you're, you're gonna have a good year um let's get into football first of all how worried are you that we won't have a season and how confident are you that if we did it would be potentially a half a year half a year 10 games um something altered uh i mean does it worry me yeah i mean obviously i mean i think it, it, coming from a business perspective it does because i mean we have a lot that's invested into to football for the most part but uh personally i still think that football happens this year now i'd like to think that i'm a little bit you know cautiously optimistic uh i want to think good you know i want to make sure i keep those positive vibes out there that's what we do a lot is just trying to say hey don't dwell on what may not happen. Let's just focus on what could happen and, and then take it from there. I think there's so much negativity that's going on. It kind of gives people an outlet, uh, especially right now, to, to give themselves something else to, to go on there, to go watch your show, to watch our show, whatever it is. If it's yeah. for 5, 10, 15 minutes, get something in there other than a bunch of numbers on a screen that you're listening to for your, your favorite news station. You know what I mean? So yeah. if you're asking me, I think football happens this year. It may be somewhat delayed. It may be somewhat shortened. It will not surprise me, though, that if football, the NFL, is the first sport to come back this season and people are going to be so, so starved for sports content, they're going to eat up the NFL this year. But I don't think we're going to have – a college uh, football season because there's so many variables at play, so many stadiums, so many groups of personnel. Uh, that is a, a horrible thing for the development of the NFL, for guys like ETN who sat out a year or, or went back to college, decided not to enter the NFL. Now he's going to enter and uh, you know not have had that college year. If, if that happens, I mean, maybe we see some remar uh, remarkable, um, you know, improvement, and then we can get back to, to normal life to some degree. Uh, but I think that if we do have a a season, we won't have fans for a while. I think that that, that would be that's something they're not going to play around with. If we even get to a point where we can play football, I don't think the NFL is going to be like let's let's not push our luck and let's get some games on TV. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's kind of my take. I hope you're right. I hope we're playing. And, um, I've asked a bunch of people that question and most people are being pretty optimistic at this point. So I'm feeling good. Even if they scale back the stadiums, right? Maybe they don't open up the upper decks of stadiums. Maybe there's something else that they can kind of play around. Maybe they only fill every other section, whatever it is. It may not happen right away. Like you said, but I, I got to think at some point it's going to return to normal. Yeah. normal you know yeah. what i mean i mean we can't be like that forever uh things are going to go back i think a lot of people are just more overly cautious right now because of everything that's going on uh but what was it just last season people sitting next you know side by side eighty thousand strong not thinking twice about it yeah it just may take some time for it to get to that point yeah and i hope that we don't have some kind of uh reigniting of this in you know the summer months which are coming around the corner <laughs> you know, there's talk about how that could, it could come back, but uh, okay. So, top sleepers for 2020. Who are the top? Let's give me one like bigger name guy, like somebody you draft maybe even in round two or three, uh, and then give me at least a couple other sleepers spread out, whether they're big name deep. Right. I mean, I, when I typically look at sleepers, I'm looking a little bit deeper the first two rounds yeah 
I don't know if I can call anybody a sleeper because they're in the first two rounds for a reason. But if I'm targeting anybody, Undervalued. I've been on the Nick Chubb bandwagon for a long time. I'm not hopping off of it now. Uh, I love the addition of Jack Conklin through free agency. Can't really call him a sleeper, though. He's somebody right there in the first two rounds yeah. that I'm still going to actively go after. I, I love Nick Chubb here in the early rounds. Okay. And middle rounds or somebody you consider to be more of a sleeper in your your uh, definition. Right. I, I At my site, Sleeper U, I created this new kind of way to look at, at sleeper players. That's why it's like a university of sleepers. Um, and and I've, I, I, I fight with people constantly on me calling a bigger name player a sleeper, and it's all perspective. But the way I look at it is there are different levels. You could sleep on a guy at number 10 overall because he deserves to be number three. So it's really perspective, but I get what you're saying. And Chubb, to me, with Stefanski there, the fact that he what he did with Dalvin Cook means that they're going to do the same thing with that running attack in Cleveland. And and I'm not scared of Hunt. I think Hunt is an asset if you can cuff him. I think that gives you a locked and loaded top five running back. So I'm with you. I'm on board uh, the, the Chubb train in 2020. But mid, mid-range, anybody else that uh, comes to mind? I got, I got one from each position here, and I'm going to spit them each out here and, and a few reasons as to why. So okay. one quarterback that a lot of people just love to hate and – I understand part of it. Uh, however, from a perspective of value, I don't hate Derek Carr as of right now. I mean, right now he is the very last quarterback being drafted as far as ADP wise, and he finished 17th overall. I do not spend early draft picks on quarterbacks. I just, I just don't. I would rather get some of that value a little bit later and kind of load up on the skill positions earlier in drafts, especially when we get to some of the bigger names. We'll talk about probably here in a few minutes with like Lamar Jackson and Patrick Mahomes. Uh, but what did Derek Carr have last year? He had Darren Waller, and that was about it. And he still threw for like 4,000 yards. I expect them to add a weapon in the draft. And Derek Carr is somebody who's highly, highly underrated and, and could definitely come into the season and give you some decent value from the quarterback position. Okay, that's QB. Uh, what about uh, running back? I got Tony Pollard as a running back, Love somebody him. who I'm paying attention to here. Uh, in, in Dallas, I mean, we knew, you know, coming into the season, the whole Mike McCarthy effect. What's going to happen with this offense? Now, uh, we used to hate it in Green Bay, right? It was like free Aaron Jones. Yep. I don't expect them to handcuff back Ezekiel Elliott that much, but Tony Pollard is somebody who I could see getting a lot of snaps out of the slot. They lost Randall Cobb, and now they're looking for that other type of hybrid playmaker. That could be Tony Pollard. He was, you know, super efficient here in 2019. He actually finished eighth in 2019 in yards per touch among running backs, 5.6 yards per touch. The guy can make things happen. Just got to get the ball into his hands. I love Tony Pollard. And right now he's happening and, you know, getting drafted after the 11th round. And he's really not going to be one of those guys who moves up because he is more looked at as a handcuff. There are three players that I, I think that people need to have, even if they don't have the starter. Tony Pollard, so I'm totally in agreement with you, could win you a league if he gets inserted into that lineup. And people forget that when Elliott was going to hold out, and he was only going to hold out like, you know, people thought maybe five, six, seven games, everyone knew that Pollard would be back on the bench by midseason, and he was still getting drafted in like the third and fourth round in redraft leagues uh, when Zeke was holding out. So that tells you how much people love this guy in that offense. So people have short memories. Make sure you grab him no matter what. And then Madison and Hunt. I think these two are also league-winning players that if the opportunity knocks, they will win you your league in 2020. Uh, I love the Pollard pick. Wide receiver? Yeah, uh, oh, uh, wide receiver. I got Paris Campbell right now of the, okay. of the Colts. Uh, I mean, I do have a feeling that they're going to add another you know, pass-catching weapon in Indianapolis, but this is somebody who struggled with injuries all of last season, and a lot of people, I think, have basically forgotten about him, but now with Phillip Rivers there at quarterback – What's one of the biggest knocks on Phillip Rivers is he just doesn't have the arm anymore, right? He can't throw the ball downfield. Well, maybe that hurts T.Y. Hilton a little bit. And if Paris Campbell can stay healthy, he's definitely something that, that you know can eat on those underneath routes, those small uh, crossing routes that he can get the ball, create some separation. And then with his speed, he's a 4-3 guy. He's got plenty of speed. He can make some big things happen. Uh, definitely somebody who at the end of drafts right now, he's probably be looking right around the 12th round or so. I think a breakout potential is in Paris Campbell here for 2020. Okay. Uh, top QB bust. Mm. QB bust. Uh, 
I'll, I'm kind of going to make it more of an avoid. I'm going to avoid Lamar Jackson, and I know what people are going to say. You know, I can't believe you're going to go out there and avoid the MVP, the guy who went out there and led you know fantasy football and scoring. I don't want to spend a second round pick on it, and I have a feeling by the time you get to your fantasy football drafts, especially for redraft, he's going to be there in the second, third round. Heck, some of the home leagues out there are probably going to put him in the first round. I mean, it's just going to be too high. I can't do that. I mean, we kind of saw what the ceiling was, right? He can't get much better than what he was last year. So in my mind, there's only one way to go, which is down. And look what happened with Patrick Mahomes, right? He was one of those guys that was thrust up into those early rounds in 2019, underwhelmed for the draft, you know, the capital that you had to spend on him. So I'm going to avoid Lamar Jackson. I love the player. I love the hype. I love everything about Lamar Jackson. I just think maybe, you know, the loss of Marshall Yonda on the offensive line, the the ability just to continue to run the ball in, in Baltimore, maybe he continues to progress as a passer a little bit more this year, but I can't spend that early draft pick Let, on Lamar Jackson. Let's pause there because that's a great topic. I'm probably one of the, I would say, biggest analysts in the industry that is a pro QB early analyst and I, I take a lot of heat for it in my comments i take a lot of heat for it i have a lot of people that support it as well though there's a reason that lamar and mahomes are, have a, a second round adp people are think it's almost like a trump voter a trump voter isn't going to admit they're a trump voter and then the polls come out and trump you know wins an election nobody wants to admit they're an early <laughs> qb drafter i will I, i'm also a late qb drafter too patrick mahomes was number one of my bold predictions for 2018 you find lamar and mahomes in the later rounds i love the approach as well it's situational base for me so if i'm sitting there at 2.10 and i'm looking at amari cooper keenan allen other players that that aren't falling to me that i want i'm not hesitating on taking pat mahomes or lamar jackson now if i'm looking at eckler or drake or someone that I absolutely love in 2020, I'll go the way to QB approach. I love them both. But what I don't get is how everyone and their mother seems to say that if you draft a QB early, you're setting yourself up for disaster when you can draft a Chark. Not 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 this year, but get a guy like Chark or get a guy like McLaurin this year late and rival anybody's wide receiver that they get in the second round when you're talking to the names that I was throwing out. What is... When do you draw? Okay, you draw the line, no QB early at some point. But when do you flip back over and say, you know what, the value is too strong here? And, and, and I mean, I'm on record to being one of the biggest Ronald Jones haters of all time. But I, I kind of say the same thing with him. Everybody has value, right? It just depends at what point does it become value. Uh, mm -hmm. I think, like you said, if, if there's nobody on the board that you have gone into a draft wanting maybe somebody that you were hoping to fall to you gets taken a pick earlier there's nobody on the board then no i'm not going to overly reach and i'm not going to to just take somebody just because he's on the top of the draft list it doesn't work like that for me either yeah. there are exceptions it just really depends there's so many options out there going into the year that i would hope that I'm not out of options by round two. Uh, hopefully, I have a, a little bit bigger of a of a name, bench of players that I like. But name if, some if wide other... name some wide receivers that you like at the bottom. That and I'm not trying to play gotcha because everyone's against my approach more than than yours. Uh, but I'd love to know what wide receivers you love at the bottom of round two that make more sense than Mahomes because Godwin's gone. Um, you know, all these top wide receivers that I consider wide receiver ones are gone. I'm not invested in Cooper. Are you? Or what other wide receivers do you like over Mahomes? No, I 100% not going to be Amari Cooper. Let um, me look here at the back half. Glad to hear you and say honestly, that. Honestly, <laughs> probably not. I mean, more than likely, I'm going to do my best. To, I mean, and I do this, this is another one of the things that I maybe I do, and, and others don't. I like to go super heavy on running backs. So usually, my first two or three picks are going to be running backs. In my mind. You win fantasy football matchups by scoring points, right? Well, you can only score points if you're touching the ball. If I can lock up 20 carries, 20 touches a, a game for three guys in three straight rounds, that means every week I'm getting 60 touches out of those three spots. So I'm not against going running back, running back, running back whatsoever, as long as there's somebody on the board that's going to get the volume in an offense that is capable of running the ball. So personally, I would probably look more towards like a – a Leonard Fournette. I mean, heck, right now the ADP for Dalvin Cook is the last pick of the second round. To me, no, am I that, 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 that that's got to be you're you're looking at calculator. I bet they're not updated. 
Co- yeah, it's not co- updated yet, but I mean, it's still early. You co- know what I mean, yeah, it's Cook's just, top uh, five. Cook's top five, top six, I think, on ADP. So, you think overall? Oh yes, yeah, yeah. I've looked. I've done. I can't tell you how many mock drafts I've done. Cook would not last pick, uh, past pick eight. That's old data that they haven't updated. Um, don't let that that detour you there. He's top. He's top. I haven't seen him go below eight. There's no way. Yeah. It, well, here's the thing, and it, and it really depends, like where you go back to how do people value certain individuals a lot right. of people look at dalvin last year as all right well that's what you know the ceiling is for him he's too injury or prone that's not going to happen again or they lost digs on the outside now they're going to stack the box against dalvin cook there's always those other people out there with their different mindsets than and i'm sure you see it almost every draft that you do there's always a player somewhere that ends up falling later than they probably should because yeah. t- people are too caught up on the name or the the national narrative of that player yeah. instead of having their own opinion for a player. Last year, I made a video on Dalvin Cook specifically. It was like a 10 to 12 minute video on nothing but Dalvin Cook as to why he needed to be a must have running back. Mm-hmm. I went back to that video and just read through the comments. That's I fun. can't tell you how many people just absolutely bashed me and told me how stupid I was for Dalvin. But you know what? In my opinion, I looked at the research. I, I valued him where I valued him, and that's where I put him. Yeah, he he could go that early. I mean, talent wise, absolutely, hundred percent. But if he goes earlier, who falls? Does that mean like the likes of a Joe Mixon, a Leonard Fournette, a Josh Jacobs? I love Josh Jacobs this year. Uh, yeah, Maybe. I can tell you where these ADPs are because I've done so many. Jacobs is around twelve to fourteen. Fournette is falling about 14 to 18, so you could get him there. Mixon's about 11 to 15 overall. Um, and all, and Mixon, Fournette, I take I take Mahomes over those two. And that's me, and I, I, get, I get the hate that comes with that, and I'm fine with it. I, I think both of you, you and I, are pretty thick-skinned guys. I think we can handle it. Um, I love looking at the comments, too, a year later. Um, but but I, I'm just not risking it and putting it on the line with both of those running backs in particular. They're probably my two avoids because I think Mixon and Fournette both are on and off the field bad decision makers. Uh, both have some injury-prone labels that, yeah, you could argue are unfair. You could argue that a lot of players have injury prone labels. So that's kind of a biased approach, I think, in it, in it of itself. But but you have Burrow um, possibly leading that Bengals offense as a rookie, and and some inconsistencies I think that are going to be kind of littered through that entire offense and game plan for 2020. I think he needs time to develop. I don't know that Fournette Fournette's not going to see near near even close to the same kind of targets he got in 20. 20 with the changes that are going to be made with that offense. I don't think that Fournette is worth the risk at 14, 15. Would I take him at 20? Maybe. 22. Would I take him there to trade him? Probably. But those would be my two avoids. Why do you like Mixon? Why do you like Fournette? Um, what about these two makes uh, for a great pick, in your opinion? Especially for, for Mixon, for me. All right? I know he'll have a lot of the, the off-the-field issues because of what happened. Yeah. You know, basically when he was in college, is he a model citizen? No, he's probably not. But he's running now behind a, an improved offensive line. Don't forget they lost their first round pick last year, Jonah Williams. He's back on that offensive line. That's a good point. And more than anything, I mean, Joe Burrow is going to come into that offense. And what is one way that you really take the pressure off of a rookie quarterback? You develop a run game. And Joe Mason was starting to gain that steam and really show people at the end of 2019 what he's capable of. I actually was at the Week 17 game. I I drove up to Cincinnati, saw the the Bengals and and Browns play. And and Joe Mason, he was just – he was running with a purpose. And to me, if he can run behind the worst team in the NFL, whatever improvements they've made or they will continue to make throughout the draft – it's only going to improve him. He's capable of playing all three downs. He's great on the goal line. He can catch passes out of the backfield. He's going to have that improved offensive line and a quarterback who's going to need that help. Uh, to me, he's almost a lock for 20 touches a week on, on most uh, you know, occasions. There's nobody really to challenge him for touches. I mean, who are we really worried about in that backfield? Yeah. No, I'm not, unless he draft somebody. But I, he vanished yeah. for half of a year. So it's just hard to count on him. I get the appeal. The talent is there. No question about it. Um, things that also concern me is he's on Instagram live partying and doing all kinds of things. Not currently right this second, but he was mo- like a month ago. Mm-hmm. And, and it was kind of the talk of Instagram. Like, this guy's not taking anything seriously. And he's a poor decision maker. And it, it just, that worries me. That worries me, especially when you factor in the other red flags, multiple red flags together. 
it, it makes me a, a void a player, but that's that's me. I can understand uh, the appeal. With with that being said, then why is there uh, so much love for Kareem Hunt? Uh, true. That you know that touche. Uh, <laughs> but but I'm not. It's all about value, though. You know what I mean. Mm-hmm. So if Mixon's going in the top eleven to fifteen, I'm putting everything on the line. Kareem Hunt. I'm not counting on his character making him a you know a for sure lock. I'm counting on the fact that you know if he does stay out of trouble at round seven or eight nine where he's going. He could win you a league, but a good point in terms of like dynasty or in general, you know, thinking about it. it those are the biases that we all have uh, that we have to fight through with every yeah, evaluation that, we make. <laughs> yeah, and that's the hardest part is I mean, so there's so many times you can say, well, I had Mixon on my team all the time. I had that guy last year. He sucked. I'm not drafting him this year. Yeah, I mean, people do that all the time. Everybody's guilty of it, and then everybody has their reasoning behind him. Yeah, Fournette worries me because uh, you know the the Jaguars pretty much wrote him off. They give him one more warning, saying you we will give you one last chance. And then I think right after that, I believe he had that hundred mile an hour speeding ticket, which is not a big deal in itself. But the guy cannot, I think, stay focused and be a good locker room guy. That worries me when you mix in the the injury prone tag that he has the fact that they have three rushing touchdowns to to speak of in 2019 all of which were his but in the fact that i think they won't give him near the same amount of receptions but that's to be determined uh to be seen but yeah i mean and you got what you got gardner Minshew back under center so i mean he did well in the short passing game in that time maybe that's something that does continue i mean there's always that you can say that with anybody. I mean, you can always say, oh, I don't think he's going to get the targets this year like he saw last year. Yeah. But what what says that or how do we know that? It's just all Co- coaching, spe- speculation. And coaching, you but, I mean? but yeah, no, I hear you. It's, it's definitely a debate to be had. And I know I'm in the minority. Most people are going to agree with you. We'll probably see it in the comments like, I would never take Mahomes or Lamar early. And, 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 and sometimes I don't. <laughs> I loved Kyler Murray in round six or seven until DeAndre Hopkins got traded to my Arizona Cardinals, your former state. Uh, but I'm an AZ and, and I'm excited, but he went from, I'll tell you, Jake, you're not going to believe where his ADP is. It's probably in the back end of the third round right now. Kyler yeah, Murray. I don't, I don't doubt that. When we did our rankings the other day uh, on our channel, I had Kyler Murray, I think, ranked number, thir- number three right yeah. after Mahomes. And, Absolutely. And people are like, there's no way that he's going to be that high. I'm like, I'm, I'm, this is not bias. I mean, yeah. uh, I, I get it. I'm from Arizona, originally born and raised. Right. I'm not playing Homer here. This is fantasy football points, and the, the kid's going to score a lot of points yeah. this year. Yeah, but but he was my weight on a QB favorite until mm-hmm. that trade, and I had him number four overall from January until that point, and, and I got ripped apart for it constantly, too. Mm-hmm. But but as soon as that trade happened, he's everybody's number three now, and he's like a top you know three a top three or a third drafted player for most people, um, which I think he can still earn. But I wouldn't. That's where I might draw the line for me and say, hey, I can take if I'm if I'm at that point, I'd rather take a Watson two rounds later because I've seen him mm-hmm. fall to five, and I think Watson, you know, depending on how people react to the Brandon Cooks trade, what do you think of Brandon Cooks? Do you think he could be? I, it was a horrible trade. I mean, trading Cooks for Hopkins, essentially. Uh, but yeah. what do you think about Cooks? Could he do well in Houston? I mean, somebody needs to go check on Bill O'Brien. I mean, I yeah. I, I have no idea what they're trying to accomplish taking on the contracts <laughs> I, of I don't know. David Johnson and Brandon Cooks. and uh, Talent-wise, I love what Brandon Cooks brings to the table. We saw it at his time when he was in New England and New Orleans. The guy can go out there. He's a 1,000-yard receiver. The problem is... He's racked up so many concussions. Uh, he's not one of these, you know, big-bodied wide receivers that can really take that contact. And, and what is Deshaun Watson now surrounded with? I mean, he's got, uh, you know, Randall Cobb injury prone. Now he's got Brandon Cooks struggles with concussions. Will Fuller, he's permanently injured. It seems like. Yeah. You got Kiki QT. He can't get on the field. I mean, what is going on? I mean, David Johnson in the backfield. How healthy is he? The last time we saw him on the field. Dude looked like he was running like in slow motion. I mean, yeah. it just it just wasn't, and that's my concern with Watson. And I think you may get good value for Watson because people may yeah. kind of take that narrative, and he may fall a little bit farther. Yeah, uh, I think that Deshaun Watson's out to prove a lot of people wrong, and he's a great quarterback. But if these weapons can't stay healthy and on the field, I have a feeling that he tries to to make a little bit too much happen, maybe starts to run the ball a little bit more, and that just opens him up for more injury. So I'm I'm worried about Watson. Do I? Do I like that he has another weapon? Yeah, at least there's somebody else there. I love the addition of Brandon Cooks. I just don't know if it's the right 
addition, especially with yeah. as deep as this draft is at, at wide receiver and stuff. I mean, it, 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 it makes Watson a worry for sure. I mean, Fuller and Cooks, you couldn't have like, two more injury prone wide, wide receivers. And but Wat- if they're healthy, if they're healthy though, yeah, I mean that is that's a way to stretch the field right yeah. there. But it's just keeping them healthy. Yeah, uh, and why why not keep Hopkins and draft? J.K. Dobbins, like I don't, I don't, you know, financially it works out probably way better, and you have yourself like a, a dynasty to talk about. Like this is going to, this team could take you into the playoffs for a decade. And no, you go ahead and trade away Hopkins, who had to have been a fan favorite. You know what a horrible! I, I can't believe their their people are not protesting on the street. Well, they can't right now. We can't right now. Right. Yeah, maybe, they maybe, maybe. <laughs> maybe they would have. Maybe they would have saved by the the coronavirus. Um, right. Okay. Let's get into the face-off game to end the interview here. I'm going to list off a player, two players. You tell me which player you like better at a confidence level from 1 to 10, 10 being the highest of, of you liking that player over the other. Okay. So first two names are, and this, this will be redraft. Okay. Cook, Cook, Dalvin Cook versus Alvin Kamara. Uh, I'm, a, I, I'm on board the Alvin Kamara train again this year. He wasn't 100% healthy, so I'm going to go Kamara over Cook. With a confidence level of about seven. Okay. Kenny Galladay, Amari Cooper. Oh, man. Uh, I, personally, I'd take Kenny Galladay over Amari Cooper. Um, that may not be the popular choice, but I know Kenny Galladay is going to go out there and ball on, on a weekly basis and, and put forth you know full effort. So I'd go Galladay over love, Cooper with a confidence of about seven. Love Galladay. And I've been getting a lot of hate for this one, but I think Gallup's going to outscore Amari Cooper in 2020. Would not surprise me. Wouldn't uh, surprise me one bit. And uh, I'll, I'll go back to those comments and have fun later. Yeah. Uh, Chubb versus Eckler. Oh, man, now you're tugging at my heartstrings here. Yeah. I told you how much I love Nick Chubb. I don't think... I don't have anything negative to say against Eckler other than I don't know if I believe in Tyrod Taylor as a quarterback enough to pull defenders outside of the box more and to really stretch the field. I'm just going to stick with Chubb. I, mean, I have you know, the utmost confidence in him, so give me, give me about a nine for Chubb. Okay, and then, uh, so he's got a, a nine Chubb. Gotcha. Yeah. And, <laughs> I mean, I, no, mean no. I, and I admitted it on the internet, so it's got to be true. <laughs> and, and so... What if uh, Eckler gets handed Cam Newton? Does that make any difference for you? Mm, not really. Okay. I mean, I think that it helps Eckler if if Newton is healthy. I mean, we haven't really seen him throw since you know nobody's allowed outside of the house. But if Cam Newton is 100 percent healthy, I think it helps him. But I still I'm still going Chubb. Kelsey Kittle. Ooh, that's another tough one. Uh, give me, I mean, when in doubt, I'm going to choose the player who I believe has the better quarterback. So I'm going to I'm going to go with Kelsey and Patrick Mahomes, and I'm gonna give that about an eight or a nine. Okay, Aaron Jones or Austin Eckler? Oh man, and with these rumors coming out that Green Bay wants to draft another running back, which makes no sense to me, and the usage of Jamal Williams still. I'm going to have to – this is kind of maybe where I draw the line, where I take that chance and I go Austin Eckler, and hopefully we see what we saw when Melvin Gordon held out last year with a confidence of about six. Mahomes at 2.10 or Aaron Jones at 2.10? Mm, and, and the other guys we talked about are already gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got sniped in your own mock draft because you're mocking with your own people. They're taking your guys left and right. You're like, damn. If, if I had to choose at that point, I'd go Mahomes. Okay, gotcha. I, I just want to – there's a line. There's a line. Everybody's uh, got a value, right? Everybody's got a value. Okay. Combo, Mixon and Kittle or Chubb and Kelsey? I, I think I know the answer to this because you already – Yep, you already, I'm, I'm okay. going. I'm going Chubb and Kelsey with a ten, a big ten could, spot. Could, on <laughs> ten can spot. I get, can I gonna get a twelve? Yeah, that? you could get a twelve. Uh, <laughs> Dynasty, Jonathan Taylor or J.K. Dobbins? Man, this is where it's tough because it's all about landing spot. Yep. And a lot of people, I mean, everybody wants to know about the rookies and having a chance to go to the combine and see these guys firsthand and talk to a lot of them firsthand. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have nothing negative about either one of them. But if right now I have Jonathan Taylor at one, and, you know, and then DeAndre Swift second, J.K. Dobbins third as far as rookie running backs go. But like I said, what happens if Dobbins – falls to kansas city and the other guys is he one then then all of a sudden i think he jumps back up yeah i mean he'd be my one in casey 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, but if DeAndre Swift goes to Casey, all of a sudden he leaps up to number one. I mean, it just all depends on where they land pre-draft as of right now. I love the game of Jonathan Taylor, and I think it transfers to the NFL as far as this year immediate if he falls into the right situation. Uh, I think a lot of people have forgotten about J.K. Dobbins, though, because yeah. of the injury at the end of last year. They kind of just haven't seen him, so it's out of sight, out of mind. He's good. I love I love J.K. the most. He's, he's though I think, the most talented, but I think Jonathan Taylor's viewed as the most NFL-ready, which means teams are ready to draft him to start. J.K., we don't really know, but he's been linked to KC, and I'd love to see him land there. Uh, 1.01 rookie, this is Dynasty, obviously, or Josh Jacobs? Mm, give me Josh Jacobs. Okay. I like Jacobs this year. Um, I, I like the rookie pick as well, but I think Jacobs is very undervalued. I, I'm okay with that. And I uh, think that Jacobs is somewhat somewhat proven with what he can do and uh, had a chance when we talked to Mike Mayock at the uh, the Combine. He, he even came out and said, listen, we're involving this kid in the passing game this year. He's going to see more work. And to me, that made my tail wag a little bit. Yeah, a little bit, I'm sure. Yeah. Jerry, Judy, or Godwin Dynasty? Mm. Man, uh, right now I still got to go with Godwin. I mean, I think as much as I think that Judy ends up somewhere like in Oakland, which would be a great spot for him because he's going to get a huge target share um, immediately, uh, I'm still going to have to go with Godwin. I I think that he is the better option in that offense with Tom Brady, at least for this year. Um, And I think from this perspective, you may be able to flip him now for something way astronomical more than you may be able to. Because if Judy doesn't pan out, you may be kind of stuck with him. So if you're looking for you know help otherwhere in Dy- other places in Dynasty, you could get a pretty penny for Chris Godwin. Last question: 2020 wide receiver rookie class or the 2019 wide receiver rookie class? I mean, they, there's there's talent at both of them, but. I love me some C.D. Lamb, and I think C.D. Lamb puts it over the top. I think he kind of tilts the, the, the scales towards 2020. C.D. Lamb has the ability to be a hybrid Julio Jones, DeAndre Hopkins-esque type wide receiver. I love him. The guy is I love just him. crazy. I love him. I wanted him in Arizona, but clearly that – well, you never know, but clearly that's probably not going to happen now. But C.D. Lamb is absolutely insane. In Houston, he'd be pretty good. Uh, Mm -hmm. to pair him with Watson for the long term, but we'll see. Uh, Thank you for doing the face-off. You are off the face-off hot seat. Uh, Go follow this guy. uh, Well, go subscribe to him on YouTube, youtube.com slash the fantasy headliners. They produce some amazing content. We got to do a mock draft or some kind of collab mock draft together. Maybe the show followers against the headliner followers and some kind of uh, colliding of the live streams. Um, I've done that with the couch before. And uh, it was a pretty cool uh, experience because it was, you know, we each grab, we, you know, first come, first serve, but there were like three or four from, you know, each side into the mock draft, and it was kind of fun. Right. So, yeah, we'll see what we can figure out. That'd be fun. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Appreciate you, Jake. No, absolutely. I appreciate you having me on, man. Appreciate it. Yep. Top five running back. You're watching the Fantasy Football Show. Smitty. Take a look.